The story about the Ricardians isn't the story I expected to tell. Neither is it likely the story you expected to hear. No matter on which side you are when it comes to Richard III, it isn't just a report about when and why the works of early modern and modern historians were shaped into convictions of a movement to clear the portrait of the Yorkist king of the Tudor mud, as Sir Clements Markham once put it. It is a tale about a journey that leads us back to the days of Richard to help understand the divisions we face in our days. For me, the interest in the Ricardian started with one simple question. Why are these people so angry? Whenever I've come into contact with them online, I have perceived them as aggressive. This does not only apply to the various comment sections of YouTube videos, social media posts or press articles. Even in the hour of their unquestionably greatest triumph, they reacted negatively to information that did not fit their point of view. When some Ricardians were informed after the discovery of Richard's bones that he actually had a deformed spine, they seemed to feel personally attacked. Philippa Langley, then secretary of the British Richard III Society and largely responsible for the successful excavations, was completely stunned. Simon Farnaby, who acted as a sort of presenter and host of the documentary that was produced around the excavations, had to come for her and remind her that this does not mean that the Yorkist king was evil. At some point I realized that the question about anger is the wrong one because it falls short. Actually it's about understanding why the Ricardians react so emotionally to Richard. After all, the Battle of Bosworth, which marked the end of his life, was about 540 years ago. The search for an answer involved some uncomfortable truth, both for myself, as well as for many other non-Ricardians, and for the King's defenders. The Ricardians have not received much credit for their extensive successes. However, they have drawn some conclusions from this injustice and have never solved a serious methodological problem which I believe leads them down a problematic path. Presumably, unconsciously and insidiously, they have abandoned their original goals. The absolutely justified demand for more balance in the historical view of Richard III has given way to the attempt to construct an ideal king. If you listen to modern Ricardians, you will hear variations of two words again and again. I believe. In the descriptions that follow, the monarch is more reminiscent of a romanticized figure of longing than a real person. The critics of the Ricardians are anything but innocent that this development has occurred. But first things first. Ricardians is a collective term for all persons who consider the traditional historical image of Richard III to be wrong and therefore seek a correction. What is meant by the traditional image is the hunchback Shakespearean villain who treacherously had his nephews murdered in the tower in order to become king himself. He was also accused of the murders of Henry VI, his brother George and even his own wife. And the list doesn't end there, but the essence becomes clear. If anything bad happened in England between 1470 and 1485, then, according to the earlier idea, Richard was to blame. The fact that we no longer accept this to such an extreme is a central success of the Ricardians, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The Ricardians are not a single group or organization. There are some institutional structures such as the Richard III Society or the Richard III Foundation. However, not all Ricardians are organized in this way and it is by no means a homogeneous movement. Within the Ricardians, there are always sharp controversies. I will come back to this several times. The society is undoubtedly the most well-known organization of the movement, which has become its mouthpiece and source of inspiration. Its two regular publications are appropriately called the Ricardian and the Ricardian Bulletin. It should therefore occupy a central place in this video.
it is the society that provides the most important services as a repository and supplier of knowledge when interested parties are looking for information about Richard III and his time. However, this limited focus does not mean that there are no other organizations. In 2015, for example, the Ricardian Loons were founded. We have to thank David Starkey for their name as they themselves write with a wink on their website. However, the society is the only organization that has managed the difficult balancing act between local commitment and global reach. Because it is not a homogeneous movement, the aim of the Ricardians is difficult to define when it comes to the question of which new image of Richard III should replace the previous one. In many cases, Ricardians are still debating the possible answers to what should apply instead. In general, the Ricardians agree with the rest of us that Richard was first protector, then became king himself, and his nephews Edward V and Richard of Shrewsbury disappeared. Accusations that he killed them are rejected by the Ricardians as pseudo propaganda. This is the basic pattern. All negative descriptions of the Yorkist king could be traced back to the Tudor period. They should therefore be rejected as Tudor propaganda. It is the history of the winner. However, this poses a significant problem for Richard's defenders. There are almost no Richard-friendly sources, or they have not yet been found. This is one of the reasons why the search for relevant testimonies and sources is a fundamental part of the society's self-image. The King's story is therefore always based on hostile testimonies or neutral sources that were not primarily intended to provide information about Richard. This is crucial. The Ricardians can only determine based on the available sources what Richard was accused of. However, the view of what kind of person he was remains close to them, or they reject the descriptions as propaganda. Even Richard's paintings date back to Tudor days. This weight can only be filled with one's own assumptions. This becomes problematic when these teethers and speculations collide with new sources. Dan Jones gave an interesting insight into what this can look like in a 2013 article in the Daily Beast. He spoke to a Ricardian before the bones were finally tested and the results were published. She was hopeful. If the king had not had a hunchback, it was clear that Tudor historians were wrong about this. It is then legitimate to ask what else they have misrepresented. It turned out differently. Richard didn't have a hunchback, but scoliosis. Nevertheless, his stature corresponded almost exactly to what Polydor the Guild wrote. One of his shoulders was higher than the other. Literally, it says in the Guild, he was little of stature, deformed of body, though on shoulder being higher than the other. The logical conclusion should be, if the Tudor historians were right, what else could they have been right about? However, this did not happen, at least for the Ricardians. Instead, the Ricardians were looking for explanations to harmonize the rendezvous of reality with their thesis. In principle, this is not unusual for historical work. It happens again and again that new sources refute seemingly established assumptions. The technical term for this is the veto of the sources. It becomes difficult when there are attempts to save one's own misjudgments with new arguments which are also not supported by sources. Many Ricardians reacted to the deformed spine in the same way. As an example, Langley was sure before the discovery that Richard did not have a deformity of the spine. There are no testimonies of persons close to the king who ever have mentioned this, she explained. She processed the information that he had a deformity of the spine by saying that she was convinced by scientific knowledge that the difference in shoulder height had been invisible under clothing. David Horspool provided the appropriate response in his 2016 book about Richard's reputation. But he was regularly seen without clothes. For example, servants helped him get dressed. So how does this fit together?
This is the central problem. If you can only argue on the basis of sources who or what Richard was not, it is difficult to process the evidence to the contrary without fundamentally questioning your own approach. This is not without a certain irony, for it was the Ricardians who, in the case of the Yorkist king, had to teach this very lesson to academic history. Those former historians like to put Richard under general suspicion. The Ricardians reject all information. Neither of these approaches are useful, as they are easily refutable. The problem that the Ricardians have an image of Richard based on individual assumptions due to the weak sources will be with us for a while, because it explains why many disputes arose. Not least because the representatives of the movement can point out that they have their own image of the monarch and not just reproduce the Tudor representations. But it is also a considerable methodological problem to form an image of history without a sufficient basis. The consequences have been evident since the days of Richard. The first and perhaps even most important example shows how powerful assumptions can be in constructing historical processes. And what an uncontrolled growth arises as a result. The example comes from none other than the Queen Dowager Elizabeth Woodville. Personally completely unsuspicious of seeing Richard too positively. Therefore she seems to be particularly credible. In 1484, she left the church asylum of Westminster Abbey, to which she had fled on April 30th, 1483. She left her daughters in Richard's care, where they lived safely. Many Ricardians interpret this to mean that the former queen did not assume that Richard killed her sons. Why else would she leave her other children in his care? The fact that this can also be interpreted completely different is ignored for the moment. Even those who accept the initial thesis that Elizabeth Woodwell did not think that Richard was the murderer of the boys must now answer the following question. Great, and what now? Does this mean that the Queen thought or knew that her sons were still alive? Does it mean that another person was responsible for the murder? Did the former Queen simply hope that her children were still alive and acted on it? None of these options can really be supported by sources, however they all construct a different image of Richard. If the Queen Dowager knew that her sons were still alive, this would obviously absolve the King. If she only hoped so, this is not clear cut. If another person is said to have been responsible for the death, the question arises as to who. The discovery of the bones in the White Tower in 1674 encouraged many Ricardians to look for alternative perpetrators. Others, however, did not want to let go of the other options. Even now this is still observable. Langley's most recent documentary assumes that the boy survived as Lambert Simnel and Perkin Warbeck. Matthew Lewis, chair of the Richard III Society, thinks it is possible that Warbeck was Richard of York. However, he doubts that Simnel was his brother, which again raises the question of Edward V's fate. Again and again re the Ricardians encounter the lack of sources when it comes to Richard, and are therefore forced to make the most plausible assumptions possible if they want to say more about what kind of person the king was than what he was not. The first historical work, which is significant for the history of the Ricardians, therefore took a completely different approach. It accepted the lack of sources about Richard as a person and instead addressed the allegations only. It was written by Sir George Buck, he lived from 1560 to 1622 and worked for both Elizabeth I and James I. He wrote a book entitled The History of Richard III, a first rough draft of which was completed in 1619, just three years before his death, which will be important. Buck was not able to begin his work until after Elizabeth's death, with the change of dynasties from Tudors to the Stuarts in 1603, the previous constraints of defending the previous ruling house were removed. Buck, despite the title he chose, wrote what is 
in principle the early form of a legal opinion regarding the allegations against Richard. In this way, he avoided the problem of having almost only a hostile source base at his disposal. However, the English historian who also tried his hand as a poet was not satisfied with this and independently researched for further sources. These efforts were successful. It was Bach who found the Titulus Regius and the Croyland Chronicle. In this way, he was able to show that Richard's accession to the throne had been approved by Parliament. He made both sources available to the public. I suspect that no Ricardian would object to the fact that in this way he was a role model that the later defender of the Yorkist kings were only too happy to follow. After completing the first draft of his book, which convincingly demonstrated that Richard could not be found legally guilty of any of the charges, something bizarre happened. For centuries, Buck's name as an academic would be unjustly tarnished. After his death, the manuscript fell into the hands of his great-nephew. He changed it massively and published it as his own work in 1646. A year later, a second issue appeared, which was heavily riddled with errors. Not even 50% of the new book was the original text. Unfortunately, the great nephew, who not for the first time to try to present someone else's work as his own work, did not work as precisely and consciously as Bach. The new manuscript was correspondingly full of errors and untenable claims. The texts from 1646 and 1647 are still freely accessible today and problematically are still cited today when people want to refer to Buck. The manuscript eventually found its way to the Cotton Library and was burned at its corners by the fire in 1731. Buck's reputation would not be restored until 1979. Arthur Kincaid, with the support of the Richard III Society, published the original text of the work. In doing so, he was able to show how consciously the original author had worked. Kincaid was able to find 93 of the 100 sources Buck had cited as the basis for his remarks. For the fact that this search did not happen until 360 years later, this achievement is remarkable. The 100 sources used are a considerable basis for the 17th century. Bach's work therefore deserves not only trust but also recognition. The 1979 republication also noticeably changed the discourse. It is widely accepted that, according to the legal principles of his time, Richard cannot be convicted with the information known to us. Since then, we talk about the plausibility of Richard's guilt or categorized between legal and moral guilt. For many Ricardians, this does not go far enough, but the fact that it has come to this point at all can be considered a great success for Buck, Kincaid and last but not least, themselves. The fact that the great nephew's greed for profit and craving for recognition delayed this process for centuries is unfortunate and, to return to the original question of this video, a good reason to be angry. If you want to know more about Bach and there is much more to tell, I recommend my video especially about his life. It goes well beyond the ex explanations here. In the 18th century, the Enlightenment changed intellectual discourse in England forever. The Tudor interpretation that Richard's defeat by Henry VII's at Bosworth was God's verdict lost its importance. The Yorkist king gained another important defender, Horatio Walpole, who lived from 1717 to 1797. He wrote a work entitled Historic Doubts in the Life and Reign of King Richard III, which appeared in 1768. Walpole was the son of a prime minister and sat in parliament himself, so he was well connected and had access to numerous resources. Walpole attacked the historians of ancient times to explain the motivation for his work. Literally, he writes, so incompetent has the generality of historians been for the province 
they have undertaken that it is almost a question whether if the dead of past ages could revive, they would be able to recognize the events of their own times as transmitted to us by ignorance and misrepresentation. Referring to Richard Walpole states, It occurred to me some years ago that the picture of Richard III as drawn by historians was a character formed by prejudice and invention. I did not take Shakespeare's tragedy for a genuine representation, but I did take the story of the drain for a tragedy of imagination. Many of the crimes imputed to Richard seemed improbable and, what was stronger, contrary to his interest. A few incidental circumstances corroborated my opinion. An original and important instrument was pointed out to me last venture, which gave rise to the following sheets and, as it was easy to perceive under all the glare of encomios which historians have heaped on the wisdom of Henry VII, that he was a mean and unfeeling tyrant, I suspected that they had blackened his rival till Henry, by contrast, should appear in a kind of amiable light. Historic justice is due to all characters who would not vindicate Henry VIII or Charles II if found to be falsely traduced. Why then not Richard III? Of what importance is it to any man living whether or not he was as bad as he is represented? No one noble family is sprung from him. To this day, many of the statements are part of the arguments that a lot of recordians like to use. Walpole's influence on the movement is unmistakable. It is interesting to note that shortly before his death, the author distanced himself somewhat from his previous convictions. Influenced by the terror of the French Revolution, Walpole wrote that Richard may have committed the crimes of which he was accused. And this is an important lesson. We understand history from the perspective of our time and align our view of history with how we are influenced by our time. This cannot be avoided and is actually not problematic as long as there is awareness of it. Richard's opponents and advocates of our days are not exempt from this. Both sides have had to be repeatedly reminded in the past that people are to be understood from their own time. For Richard's opponents, Alan McFarlane was responsible for this. The former professor of history at the University of Cambridge even founded a school named after him which teaches new generations of historians to do so. On the Ricardian side, such statements are much older. Sharon Turner, for example, demanded in 1830 that Richard's career to be seen under the conditions of his time. Turner was one of the first progressive historians. Back to Walpole. There were discussions among the Ricardians that he made the well-known revivalist preacher John Wesley an 18th century Ricardian. Ivor Haythorn made a similar assumption in the Regardian magazine in 1974. As Wesley noted in his diary in 1769 that he had read Walpole's work enthusiastically. However, the Regardians did not really pursue the question of whether the revivalist preacher should also be counted among their early pioneers. This may be due to the fact that Wesley's writings are inaccurate in many respects. It wasn't until the 19th century that Richard's defenders discovered their enthusiasm for a man who was actually a contemporary of Buck, Sir Francis Bacon. He had written a biography of Henry VII. In this work he also spoke about Perkin Warbeck and thus made it clear that even in the days of the Tudors there were doubts as to whether the princess in the tower had really died there. In the 19th century a new source, B.L. Harlian, MS-433 became the focus of Ricardian's attention. This is primarily due to Turner, who was the first to use the British Library Harlian Manuscript number 433, which is what the curious abbreviation stands for. The source impressively shows that the Yorkist government apparatus was extremely dependent on the king's personal involvement. From the source, it can be said that Richard was an active monarch and initiated many things in his reign 
that were also retained by the Tudor rulers. Caroline A. Halstead was the first woman in the 19th century to become a clear defender of Richard. Her work was published in 1884, however she cultivated a decidedly prosaic style of writing which found much opposition in historical scholarship, even in the ranks of the Ricardians as the style reduces the weight of Halstead's explanations. I show a page from a book that emphasizes the prosaic style. Feel free to pause the video and read it for yourself. In 1906, Sir Clemens Markham's book on Richard de Peer, to whom we owe the quotation on Tudor Mott. It was a response to James Gardiner, who had previously severely attacked Richard in a book of his own. Gardner said the attempt to whitewash the York king was an utterly hopeless task. Markham believed Henry VII to be the murderer of the princess in the tower and wrote a highly glorified portrayal of Richard. This led to contradictions. Paul Murray Kendall, for example, who we will deal with more intensively in the following chapter, explained that Markham's book could not be taken as seriously as the author would like. The basic texts of the modern Ricardians are two fictional works, and the first one is anything but modern. It is the play Richard III, written by Shakespeare, and it premiered in 1593. Arguably the most famous playwright of all time, he used the work of Edward Hall from the mid-16th century as a central source. Richard's portrayal is so evil in the play that it was the starting point for many Ricardians to deal with the late medieval king themselves. It is not without reason that we have already seen the connection with Walpole. For the modern Ricardians, the play was extra motivating as the film adaption with Laurence Olivia was released in 1955, which had a great broad impact. The second work of fiction, called The Daughter of Time, was penned by Josephine Tay, whose real name was Elizabeth Mackintosh. Her first pseudonym was Gordon Deviot, under whom she wrote historical plays and novels. One of her first inspirations was Marjorie Bowen's novel Dicken. The Daughter of Time was released in 1951. Its title is an abbreviation of the famous phrase The Truth is the Daughter of Time. The book is about the bald policeman Alan Grant who has to lie in hospital and is largely condemned to inaction. In order to keep himself occupied and to fight the boredom, Grant decides to investigate the allegations against Richard III. The man from Scotland Lard comes to a complete exoneration of the Yorkist king. Literally one of the last paragraphs of the book reads, Grant gave up. History was something he would never understand. The values of historians differed so radically from any values with which he was acquainted that he could never hope to meet them on any common ground. He would go back to the yard where murderers were murderers at what went for Cox went equally for Box. Here it is easy to grasp the feelings of frustration that many Ricardians seem to feel to this day. At the end of the book, a nurse comes into Grant's room and sees a copy of Richard's iconic portrait with the uneven shoulders. Her reaction to the picture also signifies the last line of the book, the content of which we can also hear in many statements by Ricardians to this day. Funny, she said. When you look at it for a little, it's really quite a nice face, isn't it? As a little fun fact that not even all Ricardians know, Grant not only appears exclusively in this book, but can also be found in five other detective stories by Tame. For Richard's defenders, the book meant a tremendous boom and not just because of the result. In an understandable way, Tay listed research ways to capture the history of the king himself. Many Ricardians took advantage of this option. George Audrey would even go so far to say that the book was a revival. Shortly after the novel, a scholarly paper became another basic text for the Ricardians. In 1954, Alec Myers investigated the accusations in Thomas More and judged them to be inadequate. A year later, the English literary scholar Paul Merrill Kendall, the one we already mentioned, 
published a biography that is ennobled even by Richard critical historians of our time as the first work that really looked beyond the Tudor narratives. The work was responsible for many discourses, for example, Charles Ross, who himself wrote an important biography of Richard, described Kennel's work as the high watermark of Ricardian apologia. But even he acknowledged that Kendall was using sources from York and civic records that had been unused until then. He also reached a wide non-academic audience, especially in the circles of the Ricardians. The most important work for the Ricardian movement concludes with the biography of the Yorkist king written by Jeremy Potter. It is entitled Good King Richard? Question mark, and was published in 1983. Potter admits in the preface to be biased. He was one of the leading members of the Richard III Society at the time, so there was no denying this. Nevertheless, the book also found recognition beyond the circles of the Ricardians. Potter was not an academic historian, but was known for historical novels or works set in the realms of crime, thriller, romance or mystery. It is part of the society's tradition that amateur historians also write scientific papers. Potter coined the following quote to explain his motivation, which is still used today. A faith that even after these centuries the truth is important. Since he repeatedly mentioned the opposite side to his depictions, this book still finds its way into university literature lists today. This can be assured by the author of this video from his own experience. Jeremy Potter offers an easy segue to the Richard III Society. It was founded in Liverpool in 1924 by the surgeon Samuel Saxon Barton. Originally, however, it was called the Fellowship of the White Boar, which was an obvious allusion to Richard Spanner. Initially, it was a small group of amateur historians who focused their work in particularly on creating plaques of memorial for Richard in public spaces, for example in the form of commemorative plaques. In wartime days, the work of the group was forced to take a backseat. Their survival was by no means assured. The group was looking for an identity that could interest a broad audience. In 1959, it was renamed the Richard III Society. The step was probably due to this wish. It worked. As early as 1961, an American branch was founded, which now has more than 350 members. In 1966, the Canadian branch followed. Well-known historians such as Anne Sutton and Peter Hemnant not only joined the society, but also took on leading roles. They redefined the organization's goals. A more balanced view on Richard III was to be achieved. A key to this was the introduction of the scholarly magazine The Ricardian, which was first published in the 1970s. The first issues in which Sutton played an important role as a contributor underlined this search for a clear identity. Ronna Edwards, for example, wrote an essay on King Richard's tomb at Leicester in 1975. Isolde Wigram devoted a work to the death of Hastings. In 1976, Hammond published a paper on the bone finds of 1674. Marjorie Weeks de dedicated an essay to the personality of the Yorkist King. The society successively staked out all the major issues associated with Richard III through its own academic work. Most of the texts are now freely accessible. Even critics and skeptics, like the author of this video, can convince themselves that they are technically impeccable. The so-called trial of Richard III was the culmination of this phase of self-discovery. It was a 1983 TV special that put the Yorkist King on trial, and the lineup of participants was impressive. David Starkey, A.J. Pollard and Jean Ross acted as prosecution witnesses, Potter, Sutton and Alexandra Wedgwood, among others, took the witness stand for the defense. The jury found that there had been more sins made against Richard than he had sinned. The society had found itself. It wanted to be the place where amateurs and professionals would work together to correct Richard's historical image. For this purpose, new sources should be found and significantly more research papers should be written. This should be financed by the members. 
This point seems to me to be of enormous importance for the initial question of this video. They are enthusiasts who put their money where their mouth is. How many people on the other side can really say this? The end of the society's phase of self-discovery can be summed up in the core thesis of the organization. The more is known about Richard III, the better is his reputation. The fact that this did not work out remains to be seen for the moment. I will come back to that. At least one very well-known man was convinced. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who seems to be obligated to do so by his name and title, became the patron of the society in 1980. Michael Hicks, not a name that is particularly popular in the ranks of today's organization, thinks that the society had already achieved immense successes in 1983. It had successfully countered Richard's traditional image, made the king's name extremely popular and introduced a new analytical tool with the concept of Tudor propaganda, which had become widely accepted. This led to the publication of numerous historical novels and later TV series about Richard, which would have turned the king into a romantic figure, quote, a young hero whom some Ricardians venerate and even love. The last part already hints at why Hicks no longer has any friends among the Ricardians. The main reason, however, was different. As late as 2015, he doubted the authenticity of the bones found in 2012. In the past, however, the relationship was quite friendly. Hicks himself was one of the historians who published in The Ricardian. In March 1990, his essay entitled Did Edward V Outlive His Reign or Did He Outreign His Life was published, which addressed the question of whether the underage king might have died before his official deposition. The society continued on the path on which it had meanwhile embarked. In 1986, it established a charity called the Richard III and Yorkist History Trust Fund to promote research into Richard's times and find new sources. The Ricardian Bulletin was introduced as a popular science magazine aimed at the masses. The combination with the academically orientated the Ricardian was intended to further promote the interaction between amateurs and professionals that had proven so successful for the society. This pattern can therefore also be found in numerous projects of the society. The bones, for example, were found in cooperation with the University of Leicester. It was the first search ever for the grave of an anointed English king. The fact that it was successfully completed was without question the society's greatest triumph to date, but by no means the only one. But with the unrefutable success came the problems. As mentioned, this is not a homogeneous movement, and now there was a massive dispute. A group called the Plantagenet Alliance, whose members claimed to be descended from Richard III, demanded a funeral in York and their cries were very shrill. As an example, just one quote should be mentioned, which was accompanied by a corresponding petition. Sue Crane wrote, I am sick to death of the humiliation that is being heaped upon this anointed king time and time again. It is disgraceful and disrespectful. They should be ashamed of themselves. Mr. Recalling recently took an in-depth look at the funeral in a video. I therefore refrain from further elaboration here and recommend that you watch it. I've linked it in the description. The querels didn't stop. Within the Ricardians, a certain distance was created between professionals and amateurs. Historians such as Rosemary Horrocks, Tony Polland and the aforementioned Ross had heeded the lessons taught by the Ricardians. However, their research was able to confirm some of the old images. Historians in the ranks of the Ricardians accepted this, but amateurs did not. Potter had already sensed in 1979 that it would come to this. In an essay entitled The Role of the Ricardian, he warned, Where the evidence is so thin, everyone is entitled to a belief. What is unscholarly is to express that belief as a fact and make the bold statement Richard killed the princess or equally Richard did not kill the princess. Contrary to what some historians choose to suppose, Ricardians are not homogeneous. 
These words were also addressed to the scientific community in general, which had been cautious or even hostile towards the society. The organization responded accordingly. However, since it relied on a coexistence of professionals and amateurs, this line of conflict had to reach the Ricardians at some point. To take the edge of such debates, Potter also wrote, there are no loyalty tests or society dogmas. The organization is entirely committed to the ideal that can still be found on the society's homepage today. We have been working since 1924 to secure a more balanced assessment of the king and to support research into his life and time. But it's not quite that simple. The Richard III Foundation, for example, has published a proud creed from patron Robert Hardy. I am a Ricardian if that means that I wholly reject Tudor propaganda against him and firmly believe he was true to his motto, loyalty binds me, and that apart from being a first-rate fighting man, he shouldered all the responsibilities that fell on him both as Duke of Gloucester and as King. His death was a tragedy, a sacrifice to end the civil wars. This impressively shows how different the approaches are. While the society is still officially working on Richard's historical image, the foundation offers a verdict in this regard. Richard was a hero who took all responsibilities and died as a victim to end the civil wars. The word that resonates but is not mentioned by name is martyr. The person who has often been and still is at the center of controversy when it comes to the Ricardians is Philippa Langley. Without question, she has become the face of the movement. No other Ricardian is more famous than her. After all, a feature film called The Lost King was made about her, which was released in 2022. It deals with the discovery of Richard's remains. For this reason, she often receives recognition or even admiration. The Ricardian's confidence in Langley is enormous. It is so big that there are repeated calls to adopt her results as the new status quo. I show some examples of comments under my videos. Similar statements can be found everywhere. Outside of the Ricardians, however, Langley is often met with rejection. She polarizes. She is accused of being biased for personal reasons. She herself has reported an experience that sums this up. She was once asked by a Times reporter why she loved Richard III. She replied in shock that she did not love Richard. This is absurd. She is not in love with the man who has been dead for 500 years. She admired him. The source for this is in the description. The reporter's question, however, illustrates what Langley's public image is. And if the face of the Ricardians has the reputation of no longer being objective to an emotional connection, this wraps off on the entire movement. In principle, this is not even bad for Langley and the Ricardians. If you polarize, you attract attention. And at the time of writing this video, Langley was the society's PR and marketing officer. It's literally her job to get attention and she is very good at it. The film, released in 2022, fits the bill. It's not without reason that the society mentioned it in Langley's job description. At the same time, however, it has also become the occasion for further disputes, which are emblematic of the problems modern Ricardians face. Langley, who first came into contact with Richard III through Kendall's biography, felt marginalized and sidelined by the University of Leicester after the discovery of the king's remains. She had to do a lot of convincing to get the project going, but the fame was then reaped by the academics, she explained. The film, which was made at her suggestion, paints exactly this picture. Langley had repeatedly been met with bureaucratic hurdles and mistrust. The university vehemently disagreed with this account. It would have always tried to involve Langley. The film executors were also offered the opportunity to talk to the academics. However, this was not accepted, although members of the university are depicted in the film. The university was also frustrated that David Baldwin did not receive enough recognition. After all, as early as 
the 1980s he had pointed to the parking lot as a possible location for Richard's mortal remains. Other conflicts revolved around financing. It has been misrepresented how committed the university and the city were, the academics stated. I am not in a position to judge this dispute. All I can say is that if the living people portrayed in the film weren't talked to before production, it's extremely problematic. Especially for a movement that coined the term Tudor propaganda. There should be an understanding that suppressing other perspectives cannot be the goal. If these accusations are true, then the film was only about showing Langley's side of the story, not a balanced portrayal. It should be remembered that this is the aim of the society. It is easy to give a balanced assessment when friends have been working on the other side. It's much harder when you have problems with the other side. However, this does not exempt us from doing so. The whole truth at this point is that there is an FAQ section about the film on Langley's own website where this insinuation is vehemently contradicted. Langley denies every accusation. I will link to this as well. It is striking that Langley has recently apparently abandoned the partnership between professionals and amateurs that was characteristic for the society. On the one hand, this may be due to the tragic passing of John Ashton Hill in 2018, with whom she worked closely. On the other hand, Langley now places herself in the professional camp. To this end, she herself should have her say. The following quote is from the first chapter of a recent book on the Princess in the Tower. I have studied the life and times of Richard III for nearly 13 years. Her role in the Missing Princess project was the one of the investigations operations room. Problem is that she does not master or take to heart the professional working methods, but instead follows a fixed narrative. For example, she suggests that Henry VI may indeed have died of melancholy and even claims without evidence that modern medicine considers this to be a realistic cause of death. Here's the section from the book. What she doesn't mention is that there was an investigation into the king's remains in 1910. Here there was the assumption that traces of blood could be seen on the hair remains. The skull also showed signs that could have been the result of blow injuries. It is nowhere near as clear cut as it sometimes portrayed, but the investigation clearly suggested that Henry was murdered. Why is this reference missing from Langley's work? The following paragraph explains it. Richard was suspected of killing Henry. The best relief is that the Lancaster King was not murdered. The style of work runs through Langley's entire book and is also omnipresent in the documentary with Rob Rinder about the princess in the tower. I've made some videos in this regard in which I've dealt with this. It is a massive problem when the central figure of the movement hides information that contradicts the narrative. She acts as a role model and opens the door to a far too uncritical view of Richard and his time. Too often it is no longer a question of presenting a picture that is as balanced as possible. It's about asserting one's own image. I'm aware that many Ricardians oppose this and are also convinced that this is exactly how the other side acts. As I said, polarization has occurred. The fact that we are talking about sites at all is a real problem. The fact is there are strong tensions between the Ricardians and the scientific community as well as within the Ricardians. Potter's admonition shows that the conflict between the Ricardians and academic history did not begin with Langley and the University of Leicester. It is much older and leads back to what I mentioned at the beginnings. The Ricardians lacked the source base to construct a uniform image of Richard of their own. In the course of the romanticization of the king, more and more Ricardians have succumbed to the temptation to no longer understand the ruler only from his own time, but to idealize him. An example from Canada will illustrate this. It is about a member of the local branch of the society. She and her husband approached moviegoers after the Lost King aired and talked about the film. This piqued the interest of the press, who interviewed the member. The following quotes are from this conversation and are also linked. As for the princess in the tower, she said 
that she thought it was more credible they had returned to England as adults and lived happy lives. This is a prime example of disagreement between the Ricardians and the idealizations. The princes were not only not killed, but lived happily ever after in their homeland. This is not a majority opinion, even in the Richard III society. Speaking about Richard's fate, the Ricardian says she just felt that it was a story written by the victors. She was convinced that Richard would have promoted literacy among men if he had been king longer. Similar ideas can be found in other statements by Ricardians. Robert Hardy's quotes has already been mentioned. Richard has become a projection screen for what Ricardians each perceive as the ideal king. All information that serves to confirm this image is assumed to be true. All contradictions are brushed aside as propaganda. How deeply this idealization of Richard as an idealized king is anchored is also shown in this social media post. Elizabeth herself trusted Richard with the children, knowing he would never harm them. This is about the daughters she had handed over from the sanctuary to Richard's care in 1484. Here it is written as a matter of fact that she knew that he would never harm the children. In fact, Richard had to swear in Parliament that he would not bring the daughters to the tower. However, this does not fit the narrative of the ideal king. At this point, it should be made very clear that it is by no means all Ricardians who have moved from no longer demanding balance, but demanding loyalty to an ideal king. But there are quite a few, and it's a trend that's intensifying. This leads us to the conclusion and to the answers to the central questions. How did it come to this point and what is the answer to the questions regarding the anger and the high emotions? These points can only be answered in terms of the history of reception. Our interest in history and certain historical topics is massively influenced by our time. I already talked about it a little bit. The Ricardians as a mass movement are a child of the Cold War. This, by the way, can already be seen in the fact that they never made it beyond the Iron Curtain. It was typical to rebel against authority and question previously established orders. Woodstock, the hippie movement and the entry of many young people into the professorship at universities were hallmarks of these processes. There was not only a desire to break with the old ways, but also to work through it successively. The Ricardians are a prime example of this development. They have achieved immense success in doing so, for which they deserve much more recognition than they have received. As we all know, we no longer live in the days of the Cold War. And it will be left to the future generations of historians to find an apt description of our time from the discourses of recent years, I myself say that there is a constant feeling of insecurity and the perception of ongoing crisis. This too fits Richard and his time. It should be undisputed that the Wars of Roses were crisis-ridden decades in which there were great uncertainties. This explains why the interest in dealing with the king is not only persistent, but has also gained significantly in importance. But we also know from history that people react to crisis in two ways. Either they trust authorities without limits so that they end the crisis as quickly as possible, or they cultivate distrust and reject all authority. For example, the European plague in the 14th century led to the radicalization of many Christians. However, countless people also turned away from the church and laid the intellectual and cultural foundations for what became the Renaissance. Both sides have one th thing in common. They clinch to figures of longing. Believers in authority want answers from the government or from science. The rejectionists, for example, hope for an ideal ruler who will sweep aside the apparatus of authority and create new, better institutions and laws to end the crisis should be clear that both variants are not suitable for everyday use. The annoyance and the emotions of many Ricardians can be explained as follows. They have been intensively involved with the king and his time for decades, have invested their own money, have been right again and again and have had immense successes overall, for which they have been denied recognition. Instead, 
the scientific community was able to show that some of the negative images of Richard were probably correct after all. In a time of crisis and polarization, this was an intolerable attack on a man who has become a figure of longing for the hope of improvement. Whoever attacks Richard is no longer only attacking the Yorkist king, but also the Ricardian's idea of how to make the world a better place. It is a dangerous path on which the movement finds itself. The Ricardians thus remain a symbol of our time.